If there's any part of video games that goes underappreciated more than the others, it's the audio. The nature of the noun video game, nouns, is it two? I don't know. It naturally makes it so that we're drawn to the very important visuals and systems. While it's strikingly obvious that most games are designed with either of these in mind and maybe a story thrown in there too, push past the attention-seeking rich kids at the front of the show and you might find that the chubby little band boy at the back is the most impressive part of the multimedia pie that makes my favourite medium. Though I'm mostly enamoured with soundtracks, it's important to remember just how much value sound effects bring to the experience. The sound of cracking a shield in Apex, and how it pushes through the rest of the soundscape to both inform the player and satisfy the rising scale of Valorant frags. To really build suspense and sell the success of a big round, to even the smallest variation in the sounds of footsteps. to really immerse you into the world of, well, every game that does footsteps well. The little so clang of pots and pans and whatever else builds sound effects are really valuable. Unfortunately, like a parent that doesn't understand the job of their kids, whilst I love support and understand the importance of good sound effect design, I don't really get it, and I can't really distinguish what makes a good sound effect or how it's made. So unfortunately, that's all you're gonna get this video, SFX people. Go and watch Scruffy or one of the other fantastic audio people on YouTube. Instead, I'm here to have a drunken rant with you about soundtracks I like, rather than a guided technical tour on what makes an OST so fantastic. And I guess while I'm here, I'll just get this out of the way. I'm not exactly a musical person in the sense that I have no technical knowledge or musical theory to back up anything I'm about to say. I'm just here to show you some soundtracks that I think are cool, and in the process, name drop a bunch of non-video game songs in the hope that it'll provide you with some kind of compass to find even more immaculate vibes. So how about we roll up your sleeves and start revving my CJ7 towards a big hole and lose ourselves in the Undertale soundtrack. I understand that some of you will be screaming right now, especially if you're around the YouTube gaming space throughout the whole of 2016, because for a very long time it would just be all that you would hear, oh my god. And that's a mad shame. Even though this whole soundtrack got overplayed to the point where the joy in the songs were almost dead to me, what's hiding underneath the sea of I'm sick of hearing this is one of the most enjoyable, consistently quality track listings of the 2010s. And a lot of that, to me, comes down to its thorough use in leitmotifs. Big scary word means thematics. Mmm, edumacation. I'm sure you've heard every compilation under the sun of the leitmotifs, but just in case you haven't, I'm gonna blow your fucking mind. Here's Once Upon a Time. It's the first thing that you hear once you boot up the game. and it's inside of a bunch of different songs. Let's take this portion of the melody, the CCG, FCC, F, wait, fuck, C, fuck, this bit. Super simple melody, right? Let's try and find it in some other songs. That's an interesting, nice little use. It's in about the middle portion of the game through this weird little bit where you're flying up a shelf for human supplements. A bit weird, but yeah, so it's been used in the start and the middle of the game, and now it's in this kind of upbeat, jaunty tune, and takes the stoic tone of before and flips it on its head to be something that is now energetic and fun. Unlike this use, which is used near the end of the game, uh, no spoilers by the way, and is used to help to add a full circle nature to the point in this story. The melody being on piano helps to really pierce through the melancholic acoustic guitars and uses its previous association with the beginning of the game to supply an emotion that I think would be best described as bittersweet as you can feel its kind of conclusive nature coming through. And then it voids the large majority of its instrumentation,
and just leaves you alone with this wind instrument. And I, I, I just think I'm going to start crying again. This kind of stuff is everywhere in the game. Hopes and dreams, reunited, save the world. And while it's pretty thick and wearing sonically when I lay out every single song back to back to back that uses it, its actual inclusion in the game is spread out enough that it really helps to pull together a bunch of different moments and make the experience feel like one where it's greatly larger than the sum of its parts. Also, the fact that it's played primarily without any flats or sharps, or whatever you call this bit on a piano, helps to give it a very simple sound which helps to drive an almost childlike quality. And speaking of childlike, anyone remember this quirky little game? Haha, <laughs> wow, aren't you such a little special man? I fucking hate you so much. Earthbound has a gog in soundtrack, and if you've never had the opportunity to listen to it, I implore you to, because you might very quickly come to realise that, like, wow, half of this soundtrack doesn't sound nearly as good as I remember. And that's because we're obviously going to remember the highs if we really enjoyed the game and push any of the soundtrack that wasn't super engaging to the sidelines of our memory if we didn't really like it. What doesn't help the more forgettable songs is a lack of a clear melody, which makes it hard to really put your finger on anything in particular. But despite what I just said, even though it's not independently enjoyable, when when it's placed inside of the game itself, it helps to really sell the bizarre nature of the world that you're in. It really starts to make you feel like you're in some kind of paranoia parade, though I wouldn't really say it gives off a feeling of unease. It doesn't really set any particular emotion, just kind of letting you vibe inside of whatever you're feeling at that moment. And so when you do start to catch glimpses of some of those really pleasant sounds, they really stick out in your head and give you a stronger emotional punch. Typically speaking, in this title it's done to normally punctuate points of comfort or joy But as games like Lisa display, you can easily invert that punctuation. Lisa uses the same kind of methodology to invoke a kind of animalistic feel or strange despair. Admittedly, I do think that Lisa tries to be a bit more in your face about its musical themes, like the weird drums that push through the whole of Summer Love. To really assault your ears and just reinforce the dirty, untrusting nature of the world. You obviously don't have to do this, it just depends on how heavy handed you want to be with your thematics and whether or not you think that'd be an effective choice for your game. Like could you imagine if Dark Souls had non-diegetic audio going on the whole time? It doesn't need to push any kind of sombre tone through its music at all times, otherwise it'd just be too in your face about the whole, oh the world is bleak, isn't this oppressive, oh feel hopeless now please. So instead it just lets the world speak for itself and uses more ambient sound to immerse you into the landscape which assists in keeping the grounded world in your best interest. And much like before, it makes any music that is involved help to stand out and set a mood. An unfortunate home. A grandiose conquest. A shit boss. It all helps to create a painting of blue, rather than paint the kind of sad, depressed imagery of a 14-year-old DeviantArt Sonic OC that a more involved soundtrack might. The sparse placement of any instruments or vocals not only helps to elevate their impact, but also bring down the stimulus of the overworld and let you soak in the environment for what it is through the in-world audio. You know, if sound effects are the child that the parent always forgets about, ambient noises that come that the dad made in their teenage years, a whole lot of potential, but nobody remembers them. We all love a subtle, calm soundtrack. Hell, I use the Animal Crossing OST all the time. But you're not going to hear anyone harp on about the qualities of the cold winds of lockdown. Or the harrowing depths of Subnautica. The uh, uh, sound of the Blast Blue Dog. You know, BB and GG and uh, other acronym games kind of get shafted in this department. There's a whole lot of love put into the soundtrack, obviously, but a lot of the stages feature really heavy machinery and grandiose visuals that are accompanied by a wide and expansive diegetic audio space. But it all ends up getting washed out by... And I'm not saying that I want this soundtrack gone, but somebody puts a lot of work into making this space feel like a living, breathing environment, and it will almost never go noticed. Unlike the Doom OST, which goes... I'm 
I'm sure you've heard it at this point, Mick Gordon's absolute masterpiece of an OST which helps to really reinforce the violence of its world. It's brutal, it's vicious, it's thick, but it's also rumbling. Foreboding. Ah, another word from the thesaurus. And so when I say Mick Gordon's absolute masterpiece, I don't just mean BFG Division and the really standout tracks. Because for as much as I like speed metal like First Fragment, it wouldn't make for an enjoyable gameplay experience to be permanently bombarded by this wall of sound along with all of the visual stimulus and taxing subconscious decision making. I mean, it can be done, games like Killing Floor 2 don't really seem too fussed about keeping the music loud at all times, but for me at the very least, it's a bit too much all of the time. And after about 30 minutes, I just can't concentrate just shut the fuck up! Ah, that's much better. That doesn't mean that individually any of these tracks are poor, in fact most of them are really good, but much like how it can be grating listening to the same melody back to back with Undertale from earlier, it can be sonically taxing to just be hit with wall after wall after wall of guitars and bass and drums. And I think a part of the magic of both Doom 2016 and Eternal soundtracks is the fact that they're not always turned up to 10. Normally you're going to be met with a thick wall of sound for about 30 seconds. and then you're given 10 or so seconds to cool off until the next one comes through. Which helps to not let it wear you down, and gives the audio more room to grow and heights of intensity to reach as the game progresses, without it just being increase the tempo, push the drums, bring me more synths! And even more than that, 2016 isn't afraid to push the game's soundtrack to the side to elevate its effects when it needs to. You know, a gunshot doesn't need to push down the OST too much since it's going to kind of bring out a lot of sudden noise in the lower and the higher end of the frequencies, but also is constant and immediate. So when you're shooting the gun, just leave the song alone, just let them be and let them both play alongside each other. But for a glory kill, you really want to push and reinforce the impact of what the player has just done. A face being smushed against the pavement doesn't really have too much of a strong sound, so 2016 decides to bring down the soundtrack and let the sound of any particular kill become the dominant sound within the space. This is called ducking, and depending on the kind of streamers that you watch, it's probably something that you hear a lot. You can do it manually, the way that I've done it in this video because I'm a control freak, or you can do it dynamically, the way that 2016 does, and in the process help to create a more engaging soundscape, and direct the player's ear to notice smaller details. It's kind of the same thing that builds effective jump scares. It's not the same as ducking, but it's the same kind of idea. Remove the audio out of nowhere, and all of a sudden the ear starts searching for new sounds to listen to. Introduce a sharp sound, and it leads to you being startled, or you can just be a twat and make the sound loud. But they decided to scrap the ducking in Eternal, or maybe it's just that I can't hear its effects and it's significantly more subtle. I guess it can get away with this since a lot of Eternal's sound effects are a lot more punchy and weighty naturally, so don't necessarily need this. But a part of me does like the way that 2016 sounds, since it really directs me into listening into particular sounds instead of playing everything over one another and creating an overwhelming soundscape. Either way, uh, you know, soundtrack still fucks hard. And then you've got soundtracks like the ones found in Journey. Which, when I think about as independent pieces, I don't give a shit about what this wind instrument or plucked asshole sounds like, but you put it inside of its context and suddenly... It's entrancing. You know, here we've talked a lot about really standout or bombastic OSTs, but if you do find the time, I'd really recommend that you listen to some soundtracks that normally wouldn't leave a strong impression on you, and see if there were any qualities that you missed in the gameplay loop of everything. You can tell a lot of love goes into the sound of games like Killer Instinct when the menus play its main melody. And we all remember OSTs like Lethal Leagues or Jet Set Radios, but what about the ones like Soma? The Beginner's Guide... Darkwood... Yeah. 
you know, the ones that kind of just sit there and add flavor and tone without wanting to draw too much attention to itself. I don't have a lot to say about them here because I can't fully grasp what makes them so effective, but a lot of effort goes into the sound of almost every game. And while I'm not going to say that every OST is worth being praised on the same level as something like Flower Boy, I am saying that I think that the people that work in audio sometimes don't get the appreciation that they deserve when we talk about what we love in our games and what helps bring them to life. Obviously, sound effects also massively contribute to this, but soundtracks do have something that sound effects won't. Releases. If you find a soundtrack that you really enjoy or want to continue to support the developers in a way that isn't just playing the game more, I really want you to think about where you're listening to the OST if it's possible. Is the YouTube rip of a song really showing the most appreciation that you can on a budget if they also have it available on some kind of streaming platform? It might not be much, but the small act of listening to official releases through means that supports the creator can have significant impacts when done en masse. And even more so, if they have an official release of the OST on something like Bandcamp and you really want to show your support, buy it there! I don't know if I've heard this correctly, but apparently purchasing the album directly has about the same impact as if you listen to it every single day for two years. If there's any soundtracks that you love, underappreciated or not, just let me know in the comments. Or even if it's just normal music, I'm always looking for new tunes and trying to keep my ears open to new ideas. And I hope that if anything, this video encourages you to go out and look for soundtracks that you normally wouldn't enjoy. I understand that we're all creatures of habit and gravitate to what we already know, but put yourself out there sonically and you might be surprised at what catches your ear. Even if you return from your sonic journey with nothing that you do like, you'll probably walk away with a stronger respect for what you already appreciate. I'll leave you with these three little selections of weird shit sounds as a jumping off point and let you wade your way back to whatever dog shit fighting game soundtrack that you think is good. I'm kidding. Your opinion is valid, even if it is wrong.